All right, guys, so let's get right into this. We left off yesterday by talking about the zone of accumulation and the zone of wastage. Um, in your vocab last night, you guys actually defined some of these terms, and one of the terms that we used was the zone, uh, the snow line, which is basically the boundary between the zone of accumulation, zone of wastage, right? We're gonna have snow above this line all year round and then below that snow line is where we're going to have the um, snow that's going to melt off during the summer okay now let's not forget that a glacier is nothing more than a massive conveyor belt right and just like when you're at the supermarket you have items that are going to roll along and drop the whole time the glacier keeps moving forward it's melting right here but it keeps moving forward. It keeps rolling along, rolling along, rolling along. But it doesn't get past that point. Just like at the supermarket, the conveyor belt is moving, but it's not changing location. Right? You're you're not going to start putting things on there, and then suddenly it starts dropping off by by the the front door. Right? It, it's going to keep dropping in that same pan. Um, so I try to use that as our analogy because I think it's easy to understand. If you're not picturing that, please do me a favor and go to the supermarket tonight. Go to the supermarket. Tell mom you need a couple snacks so you can understand earth science. And it'll be a great lesson. All right, moving right along. Here you see a picture of that snow line right across the middle. Then you have the zone of accumulation, the zone of wastage. Sometimes a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, other things that we're seeing in there are these crevasses. So just to throw back to yesterday, we said that a crevasse is going to form in the top 50 meters of glacial ice because that's the brittle zone. Underneath there is the plastic flow. And that's why when you look down in here, you can see this is able to bend and change to the terrain. But when it tries to do that, the top portion gets these cracks. So these are all crevasses going across there, cracks in the ice. And then down here, you're going to see, um, in your vocab term, we, we have the ice front or the terminus. That's right here, the ice front or the terminus. So go ahead and you can make these notes on your own. Um, later on today, we're going to talk about cirques, which form up here, right, cirque. We're going to talk about arets, which are these blade-like features that separate valleys. That's an arete. And these are going to be some features that we're going to see only in valley glaciers. All right. Now, glacial budget, right? Just like a financial budget, right? How much money you got? Well, that, that's, that, that's a set amount right now. If I spend money, I'm going to have less. My savings is going to recede. If I get money, then my bank account's going to increase, it's going to advance, it's going to grow. And if the amount of money that comes into my bank account is the same amount of money that I spend, then my bank account or, or my, my budget is going to stay stationary. And a glacier works the exact same way, right? If we get more snow accumulating than is melting, the glacier is going to move forward. It's going to advance. And that should happen in the, the winter months, most definitely. Even with global warming and the glaciers getting smaller, in the winter months, they still do advance. Then we kind of balance out in the spring and in the fall where you might have like a stationary um, glacier. So it's still moving, but it's not the, the ice front that we talked about before is not advancing, nor is it retreating. So it's just staying in that location. And then receding or retreating glaciers happen when the, the ice front is actually moving back. So that's why I pointed out that ice front, that leading edge of the glacier. That's where we're gonna see the advancing and receding. Whole glacier's moving the whole time, just like the conveyor belt of the supermarket, 
right? But when we talk about a glacier advancing, it would be like sliding that whole conveyor belt forward, right? Closer to usually the, the, the front storefront windows, right? Or retreating, moving it toward the back of the store. If that makes sense, again, um, I encourage you guys, go to the supermarket if you're not seeing this, because it, it really makes it very clear. All right. Now, glaciers respond to temperature and precipitation. Therefore, they can tell about climate. In the last centuries, in the last century, glaciers have disappeared. All right, and when we talk about the North Atlantic Passageway, um, that was ice-free right around the, the change of the millennia, um, and it has remained ice-free. So now they actually bring shipping vessels through there. People have tried to, you know, explore for oil and things. It's opened up new land or new portions of the earth um, to be plundered, to, quite honestly. Um, but that's a problem. That's a problem when we talk about where does that melting ice go. And that, that rising sea level is my, my big concern. And I think it should be your big concern. Right, because Mr. Weavers is going to be on, on high ground when sea level starts rising. Right. Now, the next point here we have is glacial erosion. Right, And when we talk about glacial erosion, we said yesterday that it was a constructive and a destructive force. Right, So constructive is when you get that deposition. That's what we're going to talk about next. But first we're going to talk about the destructive. Right, so we, we said glaciers are able to scour whole valleys, right? They're able to pick up a bunch of material and drop it elsewhere. So, let's break it down. Massive volumes of rock are eroded by scraping and scouring of valley floors and walls. And what happens is the glacier moves through a V-shaped valley and it literally scours out and makes a U-shaped valley, right? Because it goes through like a bulldozer and it's gonna scrape all of this part out, all this, and then these rocks now are unsupported, they fall, and you get these really huge U-shaped valleys, right? And it does this by plucking, by getting water into the cracks in the bedrock, and then that water freezes. Remember we learned about frost wedging? Same reason why we have potholes on the, the roadways right now. Right the other day I thought my fillings were gonna fall out. I ran down one road and was like blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh geez, so much frost wedging. But when this happens underneath a glacier, though the pothole material that you're thinking about, rather than getting you know spread all over the road, now it actually gets scooped up in the bottom of the glacier, frozen into that ice, and now it's sliding along. So now you get more plucking, more water, but you also have now these rocks in the bottom of the glacier that are going to scrape along the other bedrock. And this is where we're gonna see glacial striations as well as um, that this plucking or, or pock marking that we're gonna end up seeing. All right, so I'm gonna apologize. This image is not moving. Um, so I will, I will just read off to you what it should say behind there, and then we'll keep going. Sorry, I'm a little behind on my, my tasks for the day. Um, so, just to read it down where you can't see, load does not settle out. Melting at the terminus deposits till. So when we when we get to that edge at the terminus or the ice front, that's where the deposition occurs. And when we say till, we're saying unsorted, unstratified glacial material. It literally just drops whatever it was carrying right at the ice front. Then we have two main erosional processes. Plucking, process by which pieces of bedrock are lifted out of place by a glacier. Again, process by which pieces of bedrock 
are lifted out of place by a glacier. And I was saying that the water is going to get in there. So the next portion says melt water penetrates cracks, freezes, and wedges out grains. Grains are incorporated into the ice and carried away. So this sets up for that striation that I was referring to. All right. Now, if we have striations, that's going to be a result of abrasion. So up here we have abrasion, the grinding and scraping of rock surface by friction and impact of rock particles carried by water, wind, and ice. Hmm. Water, wind, and ice. So we're focused on the ice part of this definition. All right? And I think of it like sandpaper. All right? I was telling you guys I'm working on my son's Pinewood Derby car with him. All right? Sandpaper is an abrasion sheet. Really, really fine pieces of sand or particles that are glued to a piece of paper, and then you use it to, to sand and round material over. Now, if I use the wrong sandpaper, right, I can actually put big scratches in his Pinewood Derby car. And in the case of a glacier, it has these big chunks of rock caught up in the bottom of the, the ice, that now when they go over bedrock, they're gonna put that abrasion or deep scratches and grooves on the bedrock, and that's what we refer to as a glacial striation. And that's what you're seeing right here, your glacial striation. These are gonna be scratches in the bedrock. And the important part, and there's usually a multiple choice question somewhere, these are gonna indicate the direction that the glacier moved, right? So if the glacier moved this way, in the bedrock, you're going to see scratches like this. And if any of y'all have ever been in Central Park in New York City, I don't recommend going there right now because you're not going to see that because the rocks are going to be covered by snow. But during the summer months, maybe with a security team because it's a little dangerous in the city, you can actually go in and see the scratch marks in the bedrock, glacial striations. So then down here you have some factors that affect glacial erosion, right? The rate of motion, right? The faster the glacier moves, um, it's going to affect the size of the grain and what it's able to pick up. The thickness of the ice, right? If I just have thin ice, I'm probably not picking up as much because I'm not going to get as much melt water underneath. Remember basal slip yesterday, right? Basal slip was because you were able to get some melt water underneath the glacier characteristics of the bedrock, right? What type of rock are we working with? Are we working with a sedimentary rock, a metamorphic rock, or an igneous rock? And along those same lines, the erodibility of the surface beneath. Right? So depending on what the glacier is moving over is going to depend on or going to drastically impact how erosion is going to take place. All right, so we're going to keep this lesson short. Um, we're going to end here for today. Um, I think that's a good point, but just in the background here, you're seeing a nice cirque that's going to be in the zone of accumulation and we'll pick up with cirques and other landforms tomorrow. All right. Um, use the rest of your time to finish up your vocab and turn that in. Um, everybody else will be turning that in tomorrow. All right. Godspeed.